Thank you very much. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, well, I understand that you are a bit tired after all the day, but well, I try to be uh, the less uh, charging uh, that I can. <laughs> As uh, she said, I'm Eduardo Sanchez Carvalho. I work in Stratio. And well, I, uh, I've been uh, over the years uh, designing uh, lots of uh, AI solutions. And now uh, we want to talk about an alternative to uh, standard complex resolution. <laughs> That's uh, the direct, okay. So, no. Uh, as I said, there are a lot of complex problems that we want to resolve with AI. And, uh, Many times uh, we go uh, for assistance or car robots or car, autonomous car, and we always think on one only algorithm that resolves everything, that it's uh, like a Rosetta Stone of the, or a cornerstone of, of the uh, artificial intelligence. But uh, we are going to present today an alternative to this. <coughs> a colony of optimites gamble more than a single human. Think about this. When uh, you think on a person, a person is far more intelligent than any termite or any insect, but what the insect can build, it's amazing. Why? Because they collaborate. They well, work together to build something that uh, one of the most intelligent uh, beings in the planet can build alone. How, we, uh, how they do that? by the by and conquer, and we can reply this natural behavior by doing the same. We have a complex problem, but there is not a single individual that is solving all the problem. No, they go for uh, sub-problems that are easier, because the complex problem requires high computational pro uh, power, and it's not always uh, parallelizable. You don't have a parallel approach for every complex problem. And also, there are kind of difficult to model and prepare the data. That's the reason you uh, need uh, incredibly good data scientists to uh, model a complex problem. But if you work on the decomposition, you are going to have an initial analysis that will be kind of complex, but easy for uh, any uh, engineering. And the sub-problems that are the output of this uh, analysis process are simple, easier problem that can be modeled with uh, small programs that can resolve that specific sub problem. How we do that? Going by agents. What's an agent? An agent is an entity that can do, do things in an environment where other processes and other agents exist. It's interesting because there is no artificial word in all this definition. Why? Because an agent could be anything artificial or natural in the environment. Anything that is autonomous in the environment is an agent. So we have an environment, we have requests, and what we design as the architecture of this agent, the simple agents, is request, response, as any program in the world, but also they have to be aware of the environment with triggers context for the workflow. What that means, the environment are going to be sent by sensors, and uh, the context will have a status, and the workflow will work with this status. How? The environment triggers the sensors, the sensors make changes on the status, and this status is read by the workflow who reacts to it. This is also, as many other things that we are going to see today, inspired by the natural way that we respond to any process in the environment. We sense the environment, something is changed in levels on uh, uh, our brain, and that triggers some specific response. When you have the wall picture, you have domains from uh, some subtype, other subtitles that all of them are queued by machines and human requests, which are the responses of the same agents, which means that you can combine any solution that the sub-problem uh, generates, and 
mix them with the human request in a new queue. So you have the whole system that is working to, with the environment, solving that complex problem. And when we say domain A agents, we mean a bunch of agents of this type with horizontal scalability, with the able to self-clone and to talk with the underneath platform, and able to self-kill with no requests are received. And also we are talking about vertical uh, scalability. Well, every agent is able to, do the, to know if a request belongs to their domain or not. And if not, simply rewrote to other mm, agent. We don't like them. I don't like this problem. This is not my request, not my problem. And pass to another one. This approach provides a true cooperative model, and you can have really cooperation between your agents to solve a real large and complex model, and also have all the necessities for a larger scale complex problem solving, because you can scale both vertical and horizontal in the way you need. And how evolution strategies come here? Evolution strategies are uh, very no uh, models that can resolve particular small problems. What's the problem with uh, evolution strategies? That historical, they don't scale well. But let's see a bit of evolution strategies before we decide, okay? When we have evolution strategies, we always have an array of individuals, they call population. Each one of these individuals is a uh, sample of the solution space, which means every individual is a solution for your problem, your a small problem, okay? And these individuals have an array of values which represent their genes, their chromosomes, what they are meant to do, and how well they are performed for that specific problem. Also, when you go for evolution strategies, we only have two operations. Crossover, which is the traditional uh, genetic operation, when you have two individuals, you select parts of the chromosome, exchange the genes, and you get two new individuals that are new performers that could be better or worse than their parents, but now you have a bunch of new solutions that can be evaluated to know if you are going go, uh, well or going bad in the resolution of your simple problem. Also, you have mutation with uh, uh, increase the entropy of the system by simply doing changes in specific genes uh, in a probabilistic or a random way. Okay, so this is the traditional approach of the evolution strategies. You have a bunch of uh, individuals, you have a chromosome, which means <coughs> real values, and you have crossover and mutation to uh, go over the iteration to get the improvements in the solving of the problem, okay? So, we, we need is to get a better representation, a functional representation. Look, when uh, you go through complex models, uh, you always, or many people always go through neural networks. And neural networks are represented by a direct graph, like this. You have lots of neurons that are interconnected. You have a in layer input, hydrogen layer, hidden layers, and output layer. For what? For represental. Represent a single function. Okay? You have a function that ideally could represent any problem and solve it. When you go with evolution strategies, we you have an expression tree. Expression tree is a very good way to represent functions that are simple enough. And that's the key, because we are resolving small, simple problems. We are not going for the bunch or the wall uh, cake. We are going for the best piece. And we have the representation of any function with this approach. And this is very important, because resolving this kind of a structure is far more efficient than the upper one. Now, which one are the traditional implementation of this kind of algorithms? We have the traditional like, that come from the 90s, the genetic algorithm, okay? It's based on crossover, as we've seen before. Then the mutation is optional, as, uh, depending on the programmer, if they want it or no, and are good for very specific problems like 
uh, finding the maximum of the small function with a very small number of parameters, and they are very bad at scaling. Because when you need to cross over all the population, you have a really uh, performance problem. Is you can distribute the population and try to cross between different nodes because you are uh, trespassing the problem of the complexity itself to the network. So you don't have any improvement. You can scale it to wood. How we can solve this? Well, there are three modern alternatives to this. The CMAS, which means Covariance Matrix Adaptive Evolution Strategy, which is based on mutation and only mutation. It's, this is very interesting because you discard the crossover and go uh, through the covariance of the mutation to get a very optimum uh, gradient descent of the problem. When uh, you get on CM CMAS, what you get is a population that explodes based on the covariance of the, po of, the, of the solutions, of the space solution, and you concrete where the maximum is, and all the population is iterating over that point of the uh, solution space. When you have NAEs, which means natural strategy, <coughs> natural evolutive strategy, you are trying to go for a similar approach, but inspired by natural evolution. What you do is to guide all the mutation again, and this is very important. The main reason, because every approach, discard crossover, is because all of those solutions are good scaling, are really good scaling. So you can uh, put the mutation on a Spark cluster or over a TensorFlow, you can have any uh, a large parallel uh, backend which uh, <coughs> improve the performance a lot. OpenAI is the only one that is really designed for scaling. And it's very recent. OpenAI de described OpenAI evolution strategies last year. So this is really new solution. It's based on CMAS, but it's designed for scaling. So you have a problem that could solve complex problems in a functional way, but simple problems in a computational way. So you can go and solve all of them. Let's talk about performance, because as you can see, I was insisting one and over and over and over again about performance, because this is the main point, because this amazing technology is discarded several years ago. What we have here is a graph of true uh, executions, and you have the iterations needed to, to get a good, uh, a good uh, solution. And if you look at here at the very start, you will see the gradient descent of the simple genetic algorithm, which is the blue line, or the open AI alternatives, which you can see that go kind of good, and the natural uh, strategy that can uh, go better, and you have the best one, the CMAS. As you can see, in a very, very few iterations, you have the best solution reach. This is kind of good, because very few algorithms can do that. But let's uh, see also in the time, OK? This is the performance in time. As you can see, CMAS behaves really like a, re a recurrent neural network. The iterations are spaced. They are long iterations, they are long epochs that go improving, and suddenly they explode. As you can see, the natural, uh, strategy evolu uh, <coughs> the natural evolution strategy go the first to get a very good solution, but far from the best one. For, uh, uh, for reference, the point where uh, all other are stuck is about 80, 85 percent. And the point where it's stuck, the CMAS, is about 99 percent. Okay? So they are kind of good, finding a very good solution. And the problem they are solving here is a thousand variables tracing function. Okay? This is a very complex function that have thousands, literally thousands of variables, and 
thousands of dimensions and have lots and lots and lots of local optimums, local maximum, and that's the reason the other solution get stuck, and even the traditional uh, general uh, genetic algorithm, it's slowly going through, is this, no, look, I had a better one. But the CMAS, the reason which is far away from the best solution at the start, is because, as we talked before, they explode on the, on the covariance, so gets a lot of very bad options. And they do this so they can do a true explore of the whole uh, space solution. They want to explore all the space solution to know where is the best. And then they come back there, so every individual is trying to be the best in the area where the real maximum are. And this is impressive, it's incredible to see it. But also, we have the execution. Execution performance is something that many people simply don't talk about. Everybody is uh, obsessed with training uh, performance because this is where all the money is. But execution performance is the key to know if your model could be used in real world or not. And how is that? Because when you have uh, an ES, the typical execution time, the activation time of your trained model is under the second, far under the second, which means it's really usable. But when you have, for example, neural networks in the same architecture, you need 20 seconds for activate a neural network. And look that the expression tree is even bigger than the neural network, but they take lots far, lo far, <coughs> far less time to execute. And this is because the expression tree is very, very efficient uh, in the execution. But a neural network needs to go through all the nodes several times to get the solution. Of course, the way uh, we uh, usually go is adding more and more and more GPUs to reduce that 20 seconds to one or half second. But with that uh, approaches, you don't need that. Any singular, any small resource uh, architecture, uh, Raspberry Pi, uh, small uh, AWS uh, instance can execute the model in a very fast way, very, very fast. They don't need any backend to execute, to activate. So, how is this all put in together, okay? It's uh, very interesting because we say at the start that we are going to sol all this, solve this with an Asian architecture. Where is the point where our uh, strategy, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> evolution strategy comes here? Well, of course, it's our workflow. Our workflow is going to be trained with all the requests we have and all the context we have to be able to produce very good responses, again, for a small, small, simple problem. And then we'll be all combined to get a result of the wall problem. How is, the, how is this done? You have the environment, and as you know, you have sensors that trigger changes in the status level, and the CMA, yes, is reading this status, is reading this request, to activate, but also you can have a very good thing here. Do you remember the execution times? They are very, very small. Training of an S or training of CMAS, it's in the order of seconds, not minutes, nor hours, seconds on a standard architecture, those times were, uh, were executed over a standard i7 CPU. So, what we can do here that is ma far more difficult with uh, other approaches, you can have retraining, continuous retraining, and you can have this absolutely automated because you are fairly sure that the retraining is not going to take long, it's not going to take lots of resources, and even more important, 
being parallelized, this can be executed in a backend, which will be even in the same machine as the CMAS is executing. So you have a very small algorithm with needs very few RAM, very few CPU, that can be retrained very frequent, that even is not necessarily a, a strong backend for retraining, but it's absolutely parallelizable, so you can do it. And that's the fantastic solution about this. You can decide if you, can, if you want to go over a spar with a strong backend, lots of nodes for retraining, or you can go with a, a small architecture like Raspberry Pi, and trying only what you need. And that's the real point that is killer with this technology, that you can do all of this and decide exactly what you want. Let's see a practical scenario of this, OK? Of course, this is an oversimplified uh, solution. But let's take a smart broker. A broker, a smart broker is the solution everyone wants to solve, because if you solve it, you are going to get rich very quickly and be very, very happy the rest of your life. So what's the first thing we need to do? We need to do two splitting soup problems. We have the relevant facts, which is the news about the uh, different uh, stocks that we are uh, monitoring. We have third party recommendation, and this is very important, because if everybody is uh, recommending to uh, buy some kind of stock, it's likely to go up or go down, and you need to know that. And also the historical data, of course, which uh, shows you a minimum, maximum trendings. What we do now is to model those two problems which are easier to solve into agents. You have an agent for mood that can extract from relevant, fa for, uh, relevant facts the mood about a stock. And you can, with the same uh, algorithm and the same instance, you can scale self-cloning so you can have lots of agents looking for the relevant facts and reacting and producing a value for every uh, stock that you want to monitor. Also, you are going to model an agent that makes influence, which means what is everybody else saying about these uh, stocks? And this is very important, but also it's a simple problem. It's not very difficult to get the influence. This is many times this is a, a toy, a sample toy problem that you have in many tutorials that you have lots of opinions and you have to categorize them. Well, this is it. A small agent that simply categorizes a recommendation to know if a stock is a good mood, is a bad good mood, or if the people are recommending to sell or to buy. And the last one, again, simple, uh, a simple agent. And this is very interesting because getting maximums and minimums is the speciality of evolution strategy. So you have the best algorithm for doing the trend of the historical data here. It's the best one you can have, and the less uh, <coughs> resource consumer. So it's fantastic because you now have your very complex problem, which is very, very difficult to model because you have relevant facts, which is unstructured data. You have third party recommendation, which is structured, but comes from many different, different uh, approaches. And you have uh, the historical data, which is the structured data. And you don't try to solve on a one shot. No, you go for the small problems. And as I say, this is oversimplified. The real smart rocket, we have lots more problems, lots of more agents, but that's a sample. You have this, and this is the point to go. You have the smart rocker, you split the problems, and you model the agents and train that, and going for retraining. Because the other thing that you have here is it's very easy to retrain frequently when you have continuous data, like is this example. Okay? So, evolutionary strategies are a very good solution for optimization problems. And they are very useful in multi-agent implementations, okay? 
And they can solve complex problems if you go for a previous analysis phase that split every problem in simple problems that can be solved in a multi-agent environment. The training times are very few, very small compared with all the other model solutions that you have available today, and even very few for all the power they uh, offer to you. And this allows, uh, I said, and I will say again and again, you can retrain, you can real-time retrain your models. And this is very, very good. You can do that with any model you think. It's only a few models that can do that. And here you have a model that can represent any function you want for any volume of data that can scale and that can be retrained continuously. Continuously. That's killer. It's fantastic. So, if you have multi-agent system based on CMAS or other ES you want, but important, that will be scalable and with modern approaches, you can massive parallelize across a heterogeneous cluster, you can invoke TensorFlow or you can invoke a Spark clusters and get retraining and retraining and important. But you have multi-agent, you only have to retrain one of them because all of the, the others are clones. And you can spread the new model, the new values of the best solution across all the new, uh, all the clone uh, instances of the agent. So you will have lots of uh, solutions and you will have uh, everything you need. And, uh, I think I've been a bit uh, quick. <laughs> so thanks for coming. And this is the time when if you have any questions, and I hope you have lots of them, you can go through it. Oh, that's, uh, uh, it's difficult to compare because you need to compare the wall system. And the multi-agent system many times don't go for wall training. When you train a re an uh, RMM, you are training for resolve the complex problem, the wall problem. And when you go to train this uh, CMAS, these uh, small agents, you are going to train only a small part of the problem. So you always have to be a better uh, time in the CMAS, but that doesn't mean that it's a better global training time. But if you uh, try to scale and get uh, a similar uh, circumstances, on my experience, I still think that uh, the CMAS approach, it's more flexible and also uh, faster than the standard uh, training of RNN. And there is another point uh, very important here. When you are training a CMAS, you are not uh, conditioned by the backend. When you are training a neural network, often you are uh, going to decide to go through uh, uh, Keras and go with TensorFlow and always on a GPU or a cloud of GPUs. You are stuck with the architecture of the backend. But here you don't. You can train on uh, MPI with the local uh, computer because you have a good GPU, or you can go with TensorFlow because you want to uh, explore all the tensors and all the stuff, or you can go with Spark, or even you can go with the, any computing cluster you can think because you just have to model it and you have training it. And model expression trees is kind of easy because it's one of the simple binary trees that you can model. And do you try to solve the same kind of problems like uh, uh, protocol networks, like NLP problems? Because in the past in there, just quick few layers of a protocol network is as, as complex as a pure machine, so you can, do, you can solve anything with a protocol network. So can you do that the same way? Or are you well, I, I try to... <laughs> I try to solve the same uh, multi-classification problem, standard 
uh, a classification problem where you have uh, some patterns and uh, some categories, and you want to know if your pattern belongs to one or another category. And uh, in my experience, what we have is similar. It's difficult to say similar because, as I said before, I, I trained the, the evolutive strategy using a Spark backend, and I trained the neural network using TensorFlow with the GPU. But uh, the training times are similar, but the execution time, the activation time, are far, far, far away. So I said, uh, using TensorFlow over CPU for solving a similar problem, a small problem, of course, uh, the training time was similar, but the execution time, the activation time of the neural network goes through 20 seconds instead of the uh, 160 milliseconds of the expression tree. And both problems were achieving similar loss after the training, but the activation time was what uh, is killer for me here. And think about this. I don't say that you don't have to use neural network. What I'm saying is that you can use another things about uh, a part of neural networks. You have to think on your problem first, and you have to go for the best solution. And this one is a very good solution, especially when execution time, the activation time, not the training, the, uh, the activation time, it's a real important factor for you. Thank you very much. Sounds Thanks to you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, have you used this approach to solve uh, real-world problems? Or just this is kind of experiment? Well, I uh, personally use it uh, when I was uh, doing the comparison from uh, NLP problems, which are classification problems, uh, when you are trying to generate text. And, well, uh, as I said, uh, the, the training was similar, that is not a fair comparison because we are using completely different backends from training, but the, the execution is killer. So yes, I tried to, to real problem, uh, real world problems, and uh, as I say, it's very good for some kind of problem specific. So for classification and optimization problems, it's very, very good. Okay. And the second one is, uh, what kind of representations are you using? Only expression trees, or? Yeah, I focus mainly on expression trees here, uh, because I, I think it uh, offers the best option for the execution time. Of course, uh, you can use, and many people using it, uh, for training neural networks. And then your representation is a neural network itself. Then you can go for an improvement on the training, a fairly good improvement. But there are two constraints that you have to have in mind if you are going to use as evolutive strategies for training, for not yeah, for training, for backpropagation instead of a propagation using uh, evolutive strategies. You have to think that evolution strategies like to decide the shape of your network. They like a lot. It's very, it's far better when you let the uh, evolution decide which is the better architecture inside the network. And uh, this is uh, a consideration because many people with using neural networks say, this is my problem. I go for an LSTM or I go for a convolution neural network. And they are stuck to this architecture. And that's your best option is to go uh, with a TensorFlow standard uh, training, with GPUs, and which is usual for this kind of problems. Because if you really want to use evolution strategies as the guide uh, for the training of a neural network, you have to let the evolution strategy to decide the inside architecture of the neural network. OK, thank you. Thank you. There is another question back there. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Uh, well, Thank you, you for talked quite a bit about CMA ES, right? Yeah. And uh, as far as I know, this method works for uh, optimizing real value data. But it seems like you're using that to create these uh, expression trees. Yes. So how does how does that work out? Well, 
Uh, as you see, the expression tree represents real uh, data, as you say. And if you want to go for classification problems and not for optimization problems, of course you have to do a trick. Uh, every other trick can be done. And uh, you, can, you have to decide uh, between several options to deal with uh, uh, the classification. Okay? Uh, the most usual is to go not for only one expression tree, but for an array of expression tree representing each one, every category of the classification. So what you are doing is representing what after is going to be your one hot encoding of the solution. And what you are training every expression tree is for uh, decide what is the best probability for those category. So you go training all those uh, expression trees which are very fast for training, very fast for execution, that can be parallelized even for the execution, can be parallelized when you have this approach. And the result is a value between zero and one, which is the probability to be uh, in this category, which you have a uh, multi-category classifi uh, classifier. Okay, we, we can talk later a little bit more about this. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>